Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. When we transform Nebraska corn into ethanol, it doesn't disappear from the food supply. It just takes a little detour. Ethanol is made from the starch. The rest of the corn becomes livestock feed to create meat and dairy products, corn oil, sweetener, and other food ingredients, and maybe a little carbon dioxide to make your soft drinks fizzy. Homegrown ethanol helps satisfy America's hunger for energy and the world's appetite for feed and food. Nebraska's Family Corn Farmers, sustaining innovation. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Mike Briggs talks about the slide in cattle prices. Greg Ibendahl discusses the health of farm finances. Bob Wright explains how to scout for black cutworm damage in corn. And Dave Aiken recaps the Nebraska Unicameral's recently wrapped session. Mike Briggs is our cattle market analyst this week. Final numbers from 2015 confirm Nebraska is the largest producer of red meat in the country. This state, along with Iowa, Kansas, and Texas, accounted for nearly half of all red meat production in the U.S. last year. Nebraska alone was responsible for 24 percent of the nation's commercial cattle slaughter. In the USDA's Cattle on Feed report, the U.S. total was a percent above a year ago. Placements during March were 5 percent higher than in 2015, and marketings were up 7 percent. It's continued to be a rough go, though, in the feedlot. The latest sterling beef profit tracker for the week ending April 23rd put losses at nearly $123 per head, with packers making almost $111 on each animal. We talked with Mike Wednesday morning and began by asking about the recent slide in cattle markets as we close out April. They're struggling again. We busted them really hard last week. We're down here in the low... 120s, middle 120s for fat cattle. They've just absolutely hammered the board again because you've got way too much fund and money manager participation and the market can't handle it and it really puts a bearish spin on everything. Was that the reason for the deterioration last week? I think it was. I think you saw money managers and funds once they want to push the market one way or the other, there's it's not a big enough market to withstand that and it just goes the way they want it. Any thoughts from the cattle on feed report? You know, it was mildly bullish just because placements weren't so big and marketings were good. I think that was primarily because you had a pretty good feeder fat swap. In other words, you could sell your fats and actually buy some feeders that had a little margin, which is something we haven't been able to do for quite a while. So you went, saw a lot of people go ahead and move their cattle. Record large placements for the month of March in Nebraska dating back to 1994. Is that surprising? Yes and no, but you can understand it because there was a lot of guys last fall didn't like the calf price because it had dropped precipitously from the previous year. So they decided they were going to grow their calves. Well, that's when those calves were ready. There was an awful lot of cattle for sale last month. I don't know what that number is versus previous year, so they didn't look, but I know that's going to tail off very quickly here. So it was one of those deals you had an available supply, and that's when those guys brought those, those calves to market because they do it right before it's time to go farm. Where are margins at in the feedlot now? Oh, they're still very negative, very negative. I don't see that changing. Now you've been able to buy some cattle with some margin and if you went ahead and protected yourself, you'll probably be okay. But I think this thing's in a little bit of trouble. You know, the last time we were here, we talked about the start of our spring rally and it was very small and very short and very shallow and then we've dropped off. Now there's a possibility here that we've put a solid low in this market that we might get to live with for 60, 70 days we got to get up off of this. We've got to see some demand out of the packer. And what's most disappointing for me, if you go to the retail counter, the retail prices are very similar to what they were when cattle were $1.70. We've, you know, we've taken $50 out of that and the retailer hasn't, hasn't helped very much. Would that lead me 
to say that the, your confidence going in, into grilling season is not high? Not unless, not unless the retailer wants to start featuring beef, and typically that's when beef moves. But I mean, they really need to have some special features, but they've got tremendous margins, so they could do some featuring. Um, I've talked, I talked to a beef buyer the other day. We still have a problem because pork and chicken are so cheap and you don't have any real wage growth in this country, so that, that's always a problem. The consumer's forced to go to the cheapest option a lot of times. Going back to the margins in the feedlot, at, you know, with sustained losses month after month after month to the industry, the feeding industry and feedlots across not only this state, but to the south, at what point is that a significant threat? Oh, it's, it's already there. I'm sure in a lot of cases, the bankers are already dictating on what's going on in certain feed yards. And, you're gonna you're gonna start seeing some some issues there. Um, we've got to buy feeder cattle cheaper. Now, unfortunately, that's really gonna start beating up that rancher. Now, he's had three or four or five pretty good years, if you sort out the drought years. The packer is just making tremendous margin right now, and I don't know how we're gonna get any of that back. Unfortunately, the least path of resistance is we're gonna have to buy feeder cattle cheaper. Yeah, why is the packer doing so well on margins? He's done an absolutely tremendous job of managing his inventory, and they, they changed their mindset. They used to be about market share, market share. I can't lose market share. I gotta buy the cattle so I don't lose market share. They, they flip to margin management, or they wanna make sure they maintain their margins so they're not going out there and just blowing their brains out buying fat cattle. They buy just what they need for the amount of supply they think they have to sell, and they just keep that margin, which is, quite frankly, a smarter way to run a business. And they've done a tremendous job of that, and they've never let this market get out of hand on them. How has this recent rally in corn affected things? Well, you know, it's made your cost of gain go up a little bit. I still think it's pretty short-lived. I think this is the planning rally. This is to ensure that we get the acres that the market thinks we're gonna get. Once the corn gets in and if everything look good, looks good, I think this thing just drops like a lead balloon. I reiterate to me where you think cattle markets are gonna go here as we get into May. I don't ever see us getting out of the 130s if we can even get back to the 130s in fat cattle. Um, hopefully we can just get up in there and kind of stabilize this thing and keep it moving because I think that provides fair value for the consumer and fair value for everybody all the way through. You know, whether or not we can do that, I don't know. Next week, Luke Beckman from Central Valley Ag will join us to look at corn and soybean markets. The Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City said this week non-real estate farm lending during the first quarter of 2016 was higher than normal. The report says the total volume of lending in the first quarter was the sixth highest since 2000 and more than 20 percent higher than the average of the past 15 years. The KC Fed also believes the increase it sees in farm debt is being used to finance short-term needs with narrow margins. Creighton University's Rural Main Street Index shows for the eighth straight month, rural bankers across a 10-state region have an outlook below growth neutral. Greg Ibendahl at Kansas State University's Department of Ag Economics has been tracking debt financing in agriculture. We talked with him earlier this week about the health of farm finances and began by asking about the current level of agricultural lending. Well, currently we're about $70 billion per year to uh, loans to agriculture. Now, if you look at that on nominal terms, that's up, you know, certainly a historic level. But even if you go back and adjust those numbers to account for inflation and put things on real dollar terms, that $70 billion is still probably close to a record level for lending to agriculture. Have delinquency rates began to tick up at all? Well, actually, no. You know, they've, uh, they were certainly very high during the midst of the farm crisis, but they have continually come down. And right now, if you look at the debt, to, I mean, the delinquency rates, we're probably at a historic low. We're certainly well under 1%. But as I kind of mentioned in some of the writing I've been doing here at K-State, I think the delinquency rate is really a trailing indicator for problems in the financial sector. Explain why that is. Well, I think farmers usually will they'll try to pay off their debt as much as they can with the dollars they have, even though they may have to start cutting back in other areas. It's not till we see that the problem has been going on for a couple of years that we'll start to see the debt uh, delinquency rate start to tick up and become a problem. So the fact that it's low now doesn't really mean farmers are necessarily in good shape. It just means they've been taking their resources from other areas and making sure they pay down debt. But sooner or later, you know, if they cut back in other areas, it's going to come back and affect their loans as well. Do you think the debt to asset ratio is an important one to look at if you're looking ahead for signs of problems? Oh, definitely. Uh, you know, usually we use that as our main uh, source as far as uh, how much leverage a farm has. We can kind of look at the debt to asset ratio as really as a way 
of measuring how much of your farm a lender actually controls. So if you have a debt-to-asset ratio, for example, of 30 percent, that basically says that your lender controls 30 percent of your farm business. Now, what we saw in the early 80s, though, was the fact that when the farm crisis really hit, uh, farmers really had pretty low debt-to-asset ratios. The reason why the debt-to-asset ratios ended up going up during the midst of the farm crisis was because asset values went down thanks to low farm prices. And as asset values went down, they took down the farm equity. And even though farmers didn't add any debt to their businesses, the fact that the equity levels went down, the asset levels went down, the debt to asset ratios ended up going up. But that was really a trailing indicator for what was really happening, meaning it went up after we saw some problems already happening in the financial sector. Right. What role are land prices playing right now being so historically high and now starting to retrace a little bit? Well, that, that's kind of one difference between now and the 80s is we saw a pretty quick drop off in land values when we saw some lower farm values and, and farm incomes. But right now, we really haven't seen that. So we've seen some couple of years of lower net farm incomes. We've seen a little bit of retreat in land values, but certainly it hasn't been near as much as what we have seen in the early 80s. But yet, I think a lot of that story is yet to remain written yet. What do you think would be an indicator that maybe there is trouble up ahead? Oh, I think you're seeing some of that now, just the fact that uh, you know, we are seeing so much lower net farm income. In fact, if we look at some preliminary results from our KFMA, KFMA farm numbers here in Kansas, you know, we're seeing net farm incomes this year, you know, kind of like, you know, probably anywhere from 10 to 25 percent of what they were last year. So we're seeing some big drop offs in net farm income. Um, I think farmers have built up some reserves over those good years from 2007 to 2012 where they were able to build up and save up some savings. But I think you're seeing farmers tap into that right now here. So it's only, you know, only a matter of time before they can keep using those resources before they get themselves in real trouble. The big question then, Greg, what should producers be doing to appropriately position themselves going forward? Well, certainly watch spending as much as you can. Uh, certainly control any any additional borrowing. I think lenders going forward, if they start to see debt to asset ratios go up because of maybe yes, uh, asset values going down, that they'll, they'll start to look farmer, uh, harder at a farmer's balance sheet. So I think farmers really need to watch their expenses, watch how much they take on debt. You know, if they do see some additional land come up for sale, maybe they want to think twice about where they actually want to borrow that or maybe look at renting as an option. You know, certainly renting won't add to their debt to asset ratios like purchasing farmland will. The USDA's current projection shows a 2016 U.S. net farm income of nearly $55 billion, a drop of 3 percent from 2015. The agency will update its estimates in August. The April Nebraska farmer says for Scott Williams, building a hog barn provides a way to diversify. He refers to it as a way of going back to the old way of farming. This month's issue says Williams began raising hogs when he was 12 years old, but took a 10-year break from pork production until recently. That's when he and his wife Donna built a hog barn on their farm to help diversify their cow-calf operation and make a place for their children on the farm. You can read more about the Williams operation in the April Nebraska Farmer. The country's top two corn producers made huge advances in planting progress over the last week. Farmers in Iowa have now planted 40 percent of their corn, an increase of 27 points from the previous week. That state is now 11 days ahead of its five-year average pace. Growers in Illinois are 42 percent complete, 30 points above a week ago. Here in Nebraska, 16 percent of the crop is now in the ground, with 1 percent emerged. Earlier this week, we talked with Nebraska Extension entomologist Bob Wright to learn why producers can now begin scouting their fields for signs of insect damage. Several extension educators across the state are putting out pheromone traps for a couple of different types of moths, a black cutworm and variegated cutworm. And we're starting to see some uh, black cutworm moths in Nebraska. They're, they don't overwinter in Nebraska, but they fly up in the spring and it's good to know if they're here so we can be aware that we need to monitor for them as corn emerges. Yeah, are their numbers indicative of how much trouble you might face later in the year? No, it, it uh, it's just a general awareness. We can't predict problems in individual fields. You need to go out and scout for individual fields. And the other issue is we have a lot of other types of cutworms in Nebraska other than black cutworms. And the big difference in the life cycle, these other cutworms overwinter as partly grown caterpillars. So they're ready as soon as it warms up and as soon as the corn is emerging, they're ready to start feeding. And they can do, the other species can do a lot of damage quickly because they're larger caterpillars than the black cutworm. What kind of damage should you be looking for? Okay, the, the black cutworm, when the eggs hatch out, they initially do some minor leaf feeding on seedlings. And when they get about half grown, they can start feeding at the base of the plant or below ground. 
and actually cut the stem and uh, kill the plant. All the cutworms do that type of feeding. And depending on where the growing point is at the time that they, they cut the plant, you can either kill the plant or seriously injure it. How would that damage compare to some of the other insects or pests that might be out there? Well, some other things to look for, well, the, the, the main issue, I guess, is that cutworms tend to feed at night and hide in the soil during the day. So regardless what problem it is, if there's a stand loss or some sort of injury, it's good to try to dig around the plant or dig up the plant and see if you can find some insects present. See what, if it's a cutworm, see how big it is. If they're over an inch long, they may have done most of their feeding and it may be too late to treat. Some other options, early season pests that can damage corn include wireworms and uh, white grubs. They can either, uh, wireworms can bore into the stem and kill the plant. Uh, white grubs feed on the roots and uh, can stunt the plant or cause wilting. But you need to know what, what insect you're dealing with as far as uh, management options. If it's cutworm damage, do you have any treatment options? Yes. Uh, if, if, you, if you catch it soon enough, that's why we want to monitor things as uh, corn is emerging. Generally, if four to five percent of the plants are cut, uh, that's a treatment threshold and there's a variety of post-emergence insecticides, foliar insecticides you can apply. And I guess the other point is that uh, regardless of what type of corn you have, whether you used a seed treatment or a soil insecticide at planting, if we have high numbers of cutworms, we can still have damage and so monitor all fields, even if you think you may have done something that would reduce the cutworm problem. So you said it's also necessary to uh, differentiate if it's coming from cutworms or not because the treatment would therefore differ? Right, and uh, the other things we talked about like wireworms and white grubs, there's no post-plant post treatment. They're down in the soil and the insecticides we have just don't get down there. So at that point, it's a matter of is there enough stand loss to warrant re replanting? And that's the decision for those insects. For cutworms, how can growing degree days be helpful in trying to determine when to scout? Well, particularly only with the black cutworm, we have some guidelines based on a certain number of degree days after we have a significant moth capture. That's when we start seeing half-grown caterpillars, which is the size they need to start, cut, start cutting plants. But again, in Nebraska, we're dealing with uh, multiple species of cutworms, so we can't just focus just on black cutworms. Uh, need to check as for several weeks as corn is emerging uh, to watch for what might be damaging it. Which fields might be most at risk, Bob? Okay, for the black cutworm, again, the moths fly up each spring and they lay eggs before corn emerges usually or before corn is planted. And if fields that have winter annual weeds or a lot of corn residue are attractive to the moths to lay their eggs, so those would be fields that would be at risk. And especially if you just, if you had a lot of winter annual weeds, and you just burned it down shortly after, uh, shortly after planting. If there any any of the black corn, cutworms might have hatched and started feeding on those winter annual weeds, uh, they would they would transfer over to the corn as soon as it emerges. So that would be a high risk situation in that case. Bob recently wrote a crop watch article about scouting for emerging insects. You can find that through a link on the Market Journal website. The Nebraska Legislature's 2016 session wrapped up this month after passing several bills with agricultural importance. Among other issues, the state's unicameral address legislation on property tax relief, the Niobrara River in-stream flow compromise, and packer feeding in the hog industry. Nebraska Extension Ag and Water Law Specialist Dave Aiken joined us Thursday morning to discuss those three areas, starting with LB 176, which Dave says allows packer feeding in the state for the first time since the adoption of Initiative 300 in 1982. This was the packer feeding bill. Uh, it was part of three bills that were introduced last year to try to really make a push in terms of uh, uh, livestock development, and this allows well, it takes away the 30-year-old ban that uh, prohibited packers from uh, custom feeding, uh, signing uh, custom feeding contracts with producers. Now, this was controversial, yes? This was very controversial because uh, opponents say that this will give packers uh, too much control over uh, hog prices, but supporters say that this will level the playing field between Nebraska and Iowa so that uh, we'll be able to keep all of our swine processors in Nebraska, which is very important. Also, contract feeding can be a way for new producers to get started in agriculture. So kids going back to the farm, it could be a big deal for them. How much different was it this year compared to what was introduced last session? Well, last year, uh, the, uh, Senator Shills was one vote short. And uh, um, the, what changed this year was that he offered amendments that uh, offered 
uh, contract protections in, that were uh, not in the original bill and also provided state oversight for the of these contracts with the Department of Ag and the Attorney General's office. So I feel that really strengthened the bill and ended up, they ended up having an, an extra vote more than they needed to get it passed. You feel those policy shifts were important? I think so. I think those were important uh, improvements to the bill and it make it bill make it better for uh, the people that signed the contracts. All right, tell me about the Niobrara River policy. Well, this is another uh, golden oldie. Uh, this goes back to at least to 1977 with the uh, Save the Niobrara lawsuit that stopped and ultimately killed the Norton Dam project up on the Niobrara River. Uh, and so this is the, uh, uh, you know, this is a conflict that's been going on for a long time. What happened this year? Well, uh, this year they ratified an agreement between the um, Nebraska Public Power District and the uh, Niobrara NRDs and the Game and Parks Commission uh, to sell the hydropower right uh, from the Spencer Hydro to the Game and Parks and the NRDs and uh, a change in the law was needed to do that and so that's what the legislature did was basically ratify that agreement. Yeah, where does that agreement come from? NPPD had started um, requiring surface water irrigators who were junior to the uh, hydropower to sign an agreement to pay NPPD for the water. And most of them didn't want to do that, so that we had several Nebraska Supreme Court opinions dealing with this. Uh, and ultimately, the Supreme Court said, yes, uh, the, the, the hydropower rights are valid, and the, the requirement that the irrigators pay for the water is valid. And so once that, there was no place to go in court, they said, okay, well, let's, you know, let, let's try to settle this thing. All right, let's talk about property tax relief as it relates to agriculture. Give me the <laughs> overview. Okay, well, uh, basically the legislature uh, added $20 million a year to the state uh, property tax credit program for agricultural land, and this will be effective next year. And uh, this increases the uh, tax credit for ag property owners by 10%, or it will increase it by 10% for next year. So how, what does that mean for the individual landowner? Well, if you've got your property tax statement, uh, you can take a look and there's a line on there that'll tell you what the property tax credit is. So you uh, add 10% to that and that would be what it would, that'll give you a ballpark estimate at least in terms of what it should mean. Um, I went and, and looked at, you know, what were the ag property taxes paid and what would 20 million uh, look like on that. And, and for 2015, the last year that we had uh, numbers for, uh, it would, it, worked out to about 1.7% reduction in terms of uh, property tax payments for, from ag, for ag land. That 1.7%, it might not seem like a lot, but can you tell me in the grand scheme of things how important that is? Well, I think it's pretty important because, uh, you know, the ag groups had to work pretty hard to get that 20 million and, uh, you know, everybody is, is scrapping for that money in the legislature, so to come up with it, uh, this one, uh, this time, it is, is, is really speaks well. In addition, you know, this is a long-term project. I mean, it'd be wonderful if there was some sort of silver bullet that would, you know, give us property tax relief. Uh, but if we, if, if property taxes go down, you know, sales and income taxes almost have to go up. And uh, so it's kind of a zero-sum game there. And so uh, I think that producers have to be patient take the long view, and if you could do something like this every year or two, you know, in, in 10 years, you would have substantial property tax relief. So I think that's the way you have to approach it. Now with this week's weather outlook, here's Nebraska Extension Associate State Climatologist, Al Dutcher. Well, folks, here again for the weekly forecast. Of course, during this last week, once again, we dealt with a considerable amount of precipitation across the state, and we did see the drought monitor reflect some of the changes in this heavy precipitation with just a small little area in south central Nebraska, still showing abnormally dry conditions, and really it was because most of the heavy major precipitation that fell within that region fell after the deadline on Tuesday morning, so we would expect a complete elimination of the D0 conditions in Nebraska. More importantly, CPC has also issued an update on the latest La Nina El Nino situation and they're up in their probabilities of La Nina conditions developing is now up above 70 percent. Last year I talked about these weak or these moderate and strong events and the crop watch issue basically what we look back in historical precedents four out of every five of these events moved into a La Nina condition during 
that year. So let's take a look at the, the sea surface temperatures and see if we can see some of the early signs of La Nina developing in here. We have the upwelling cold water starting to show up in the eastern Pacific. We still have a batch of warm water out in the central Pacific. That's helping feed some of the moisture up into the southwest and these systems that are coming up in the northern flow are getting cut off over the intermountain region. There's a cutoff of our low and then slowly sagging their way out into the central plains. And that's a result of uh, we're seeing a lot of heavy precipitation. So as we go forward in time, we should see less and less of these cutoff upper lows and we should start to see a progressive nature with the northern stream. The big question is, where does that ridge stand up? And we'll have to wait and see how quickly this area cools down. But by all accounts, I think we'll start to see La Nina conditions reflected in the atmosphere before we get to the midway point during the summer, even though we won't officially meet criteria by CPC until we get into the fall period. Now, as we look at today's upper air pattern, what we'll notice is we have another upper air low that has been moving across the region, bringing heavy precipitation started yesterday and they expect it to continue all today. We expect the heaviest moisture in central Nebraska and then it will spread toward the east during the evening hours and as we go into tomorrow, the last of that moisture will start to move to the east of us, bringing precipitation to end during the morning and then it looks like we have the potential, the potential for dry conditions for the remainder of the week. The only thing that we may see from precipitation may be some residual moisture left out in southwest Nebraska, but as we get into tomorrow, you'll start to see that the trough over the Great Lakes starts to push eastward. We see all this moisture and energy detained to the south of us, and we start to see a ridge building into our region, so a slow warming trend. Probably going to see a little bit of cloud cover in the morning on Monday, but it should dissipate. And as we go into Tuesday, we start to see the ridge taking place, and tent conditions start to warm. As we get into Wednesday, we start to see a good, solid ridge building. And as we get into Thursday, we start to see that ridge trying to push eastward. We get another cold front coming from the northern lakes. That's going to increase our wind, so that'll help dry conditions out. And as we get into Friday, here comes the next upper air low, expected to make its way into at least the western half of Nebraska as we get into the day on Saturday. It may actually hold off till Sunday for eastern Nebraska, but this looks like another heavy precipitation event. As we look at the forecast from next Thursday to the following Tuesday, warm to the northwest, cold to the southeast. And in terms of precipitation, here comes that upper air low. Shows a little dryness here in Nebraska, but I think this is overplayed. We'll probably be more into the wet side of this equation. Thanks, Al. Today's interviews can be found individually on the Market Journal website and through the Market Journal mobile app. They include information on cattle markets, farm finances, scouting for insects and corn, and ag legislative issues. As always, you can keep up with Market Journal during the week by following us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Next week, Luke Beckman will be our corn and soybean market analyst, and Dennis Conley will discuss the world's crude oil market. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.